Good morning, and today, uh, now is the new session is from uh, Zoe, and she will talk about building IoT monitoring apps with Influence DB, Python, and Flex with Edge to Cloud Replication. And at the first, <coughs> welcome to the main session track, which is uh, hosted by the Coast Cup. And before the present, our session have a QA is in the Slido, so maybe you can open the your session agenda and can check the link in the in the agenda. And also we have a HackMD, the link uh, Slido link is in the HackMD, so maybe you can check the link inside the doc. Yeah, and 欢迎大家来到那个主议程轨。然后这一场议程是由 Zoe 带来那个 building 啊。Uh, play monitoring app with uh, Influx DB Python and Flex with Edge to Cloud Replication. 然后这场议程是有呃、uh, Slido 跟共笔文件。你可以在那个那个网站那个 agenda 里面找到那个 Hank and Dear 文件，里面有 Slido 连接，然后你也可以在上面共笔。Okay, so we can start it. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So yeah. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I've already got my introduction, so we'll just go ahead and dive into it. So one quick thing is that uh, I'm a developer advocate at my company, InfluxDB, which basically is just a person who uh, helps build educational materials for developers, as well as just helps them get onboarded. We listen to the good, the bad, all the stories that come with it. If you'd like to add me on LinkedIn, I add it here. It's uh, just in case you don't feel comfortable asking questions here, or if you want to connect later. So a quick overview. So at the end of this, there will also be a QR code to the GitHub library with all of these resources, code, everything that you're, need, you're gonna need because uh, there's a lot of material here to go over and I won't be able to go super in depth in a lot of it. So we're gonna do the IoT hardware setup, the tools that this project uh, leverages, a quick overview of InfluxDB because it's one of the bigger tools being used here, the data ingestion setup, the setup of edge data replication and what that means, data request, and then finally that GitHub code base, and I'm hoping to leave a few minutes open for Q&A. So setting up your IoT devices. So this is a very pretty uh, visualization on how this would normally work. Basically the idea being that you would have a plant whose health you wish to monitor. Specifically we normally think about it as watering the plant, that's normally the most important part. Um, I know here you guys don't have to worry about watering your outdoor plants, but you know, inside might need some. Basically from there you hook up an IoT device and you send the metrics data from that IoT device into a uh, open source InfluxDB instance. So we have a fully open source database. We also have a cloud one as well. In this schematic you can see that the data is eventually sent up to the cloud and then fed back down to the application server, the Flask server. You could do this all in open source. You don't have to use the cloud. It's just one of the elements. This is very much a uh, do it at your own play kind of a project. You can kind of pick and choose the pieces that you would like to use. So you're gonna need in no particular order, and this is a great photo of my own setup at home. I had to put it on a, a baking sheet because uh, there was a lot of cords and water and such. A plant, preferably a live. Uh, I don't know if it'll work so well in a dead one a particle boron microcontroller or another compatible one. We also have the schematics for a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino, which are definitely more common. At least one IoT sensor for your plant and a breadboard with jump wires and terminal strips. And when I say schematics, this is what I mean. So we offer the schematics. This is for the um, particle boron microcontroller, but we also have ones for Arduino as well as for the Raspberry Pi, but this basically just tells you where to plug all your sensors into based off where we expect the data to be coming in off of. So this is really simple and it makes it a lot easier if you're not super comfortable doing this yourself. Like I wasn't super comfortable with this at the beginning. I had a coworker who had done this before and he kind of explained to me how this all works, why we have a few, you kind of can see it up here, how we have a few extra wires. That's to deal with the, um, the negative and plus cross electricity. There is when you get enough uh, things plugged in, it starts to get a little crazy. But basically, this is available on the GitHub. So this is just a quick uh, visual right here. And then I have four different sensors. I have a temperature and a humidity, a light, a soil moisture, and a temperature. 
We link all of the Amazon links for these. Um, otherwise, you can probably find them pretty in general online. They're pretty available and they're relatively cheap. A uh, sensor will cost you less than one USD or about 100 Taiwan dollars. It's very, very affordable. The tools that we use for the project. So we use the Flask framework, which is a lightweight Python framework normally used for some uh, smaller projects like this. The, the, rule of, the rule of the game is normally that you use a Py Python framework like Django when you're building out you know, a big website, something that you would use at your job. But Flask is normally more commonly used for smaller uh, testing projects like this one, just smaller at-home ones that you don't require so much. We're using InfluxDB for the storage because it comes with a powerful API and tool set. It's got a high performance time series engine and the data that we get off these IoT devices is time series. And it has a massive community and ecosystem that's available for leverage and that includes the fact that it's open source. Now one tool we're not gonna be using inside of this project that I just wanna mention is Telegraph, which is an open source ingestion agent. It's uh, specifically for collecting metrics which are uh, normally time series based, sometimes they're not, but normally they are. And it's driven by a community of over 600 plus contributors and it's a great open source project for those of you also looking to get into an open source project. This is a great one to take a look at. These are just a few of the categories of Telegraph plugins that are currently supported. For this project, we take advantage of the client library instead just because um, none of these plugins worked for the microcontroller that just wasn't gonna work, but these are some of the plugins that you can take advantage of if you were ever to use this for a different type of project. And Telegraph is compatible with other DBs. It's not exclusive to Influx. It's fully open source and it works with lots of other time series and non-time series databases. These are the client libraries that we offer. For this project, we're gonna go ahead and use the Python client library because that's just the one that we're gonna be leveraging, especially in a Flask environment, a Flask project, we're gonna use the Python client library. We also are going to quickly, I'm sorry guys, this slide was not supposed to be in here actually. Um, we used to use the Flux extension for this project. It was useful for writing queries, but we now have, um, we now don't need this extension going forward. We're using Plotly for graphing. So you can actually use quite a different, uh, quite a few different open source graphing libraries. Things like Grafana would also work very well for this project, but Plotly is very simple to use. It's fully open source. And the most important thing also is that it's very lightweight. It's great for this smaller project where we don't wanna have to deal with uh, running too much. And really quick InfluxDB overview. So, time series data and what it is. So right now we've been talking a lot about metrics and that's what this project uh, has. It has metrics, which is values collected regularly over time, which is the most common uh, without a doubt because of IoT devices. Events are states that are generated irregularly over time. So that's something like you're monitoring a website and you have a button that people click, but it's not consistent. People don't click the button all day, it's irregular. So that's a time series value that irregularly happens. And then a trace is just like a stack trace, basically, it's a complete event. So specifically going back to that button example, it's the complete event of clicking the button, it taking you to the next website or it crashing, that's a full stack trace, that's a trace. So when it comes to other DBs, I kind of like to just mention this really quick so people understand the different types of databases when they go into this. You have your very common PostgreSQL, uh, or today uh, MySQL is also present here at this event. That is an open source SQL DB. It's the most common relational database. Over 90% of the web is on relational DBs, which makes sense, because they're really great for storing data long term. It's where you store your customer information, your emails, your passwords. Then you have your document DBs, stuff like Mongo, your search like Elastic, and then time series. Now one thing to note, is that MongoDB and Elastic can also actually store time series data. They're just not the best at it, is the way I would put it. It's not that they can't do it well, it's just that that's not what they were originally intended for, and they do what they do better when it comes to being a document and a search DB. The biggest difference with the time series also is that we're actually made a little bit more for dropping and deleting data, because sometimes you actually just wanna monitor in real time your IoT devices, same with our plant project. You might wanna monitor your plant in real time to know that it needs watering today, 
but you don't necessarily need to know that it needed watering two weeks ago. That data doesn't need to be stored forever. You can go ahead and drop it. It's a little harder to drop data in other types of DBs than it is in normally a more time series specific database. And this is a typical architecture and deployment. So you have your data sources, which is everything that I just mentioned that you can get your data in with, your data collection methods, things like Telegraph and the client libraries, and your data storage and transformation. That's pretty straightforward. It's normally just storing your data and then using SQL queries to get it back out. And then finally, data visualization and analysis. So for us, we're using Plotly in this example, and we're also going to use quickly uh, pandas for downsampling. But this can also be things like Tableau and Power BI and Grafana, other tools that people use more in their jobs, less in uh, small uh, pet projects. So the data ingestion setup. So really quick note here is that depending on the microcontroller you use, it will depend on how you actually set this up. So because I set it up with the Boron microcontroller, they offer basically um, a website and an API that allows me to easily send this data through a specific port. This is me just basically calling for the particle and just saying, hey, can you start to send me some of the data that you're receiving off of these IoT devices? And then as you can see here, that HU stands for humidity. And these other ones stand for the, the temperature, the light. They all have different meanings, basically. And then the numbers behind them are the actual value coming in off the devices. And by the way, sometimes you have to uh, put these numbers through, uh, you have to put them through like mathematical equations to get them to be more human readable. The light sensor, for example, will come in at like 1,500, but 1,500 light makes, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to us personally. You kind of have to change it a little bit. So it's more like 70% or 50% light. So this is just a quick video where I'm just showing how you create your bucket. That's just a database. That's just what, it, what we had tend to call it. But this is just what it would look like visually in the UI to go ahead and create your database. Actually, I'm going to pause right there. As you can see, you can choose to store it for a certain amount of time. So for example, with this one, I said if it's older than seven days, go ahead and delete it. So that's what I was talking about when I said that DBs like this are meant for deletion of data. They're meant to drop the data that you don't need going forward because they're meant for more real-time monitoring. Now, that doesn't mean you obviously can't store it forever. There is a never option, and this goes up to, I think, 90 days. So you have quite a lot of options. And then when it comes to actually getting your data both in and out, we're going to use an authentication token. So you can use an all access. It just means that uh, that, that token has access to all of your databases, all of the ability to update, delete. We don't normally suggest that people create it, but for this project, because it's so low risk, it's totally fine to do that. Otherwise, yes, you could do like a read and write token, like what I'm doing in the video right here, which would then just be scoped to your specific uh, DB. It's more of a choice of preference. There we go. And so this is how we write the data into InfluxDB with our Python client library. So I'm not showing you the, uh, the setup, per se, because that's pretty straightforward. It's basically just giving it that authentication token, your organization ID, maybe an email or two. It's not a whole lot of stuff to deal with. It's very quick. It's about five lines of code. And the client library um, documentation goes into it. But basically, once you actually want to start sending data back up, as you can see here, we're sending it via a point. So each point is our sensor data. And originally, we had tags of users with the idea being that in the future, our application could allow for multiple users to store their plant data. Basically, you could let your friends do the same. The device ID and the data device is the actual, um, it's just the, the boron's name, basically. It's just your microcontroller's device ID. And then the sensor name with the value is things like the humidity value or the temperature value. So these are two different tags, which are normally, um, they're, they're, normally uh, they're, not, they're not normally string values. They're normally integer values or sometimes strings, one of the two. And then your field values are normally, uh, this one's obviously got a string and then an integer. But basically, from there, you go ahead and you use the right API to write into your bucket. When it says self.cloudbucket, that just means we've defined it above here. 
We're just not writing it out because we're reusing this code in a few different places. And that's also why so much of this is, uh, uh, what's the word here? It's reusable. Like that's why these are values that you can change is to allow it to be reused for both the humidity, the light, all of those different sensors without having to write this out for each individual one. This is a table uh, example of the resulting data points. So as you can see here, we have our measurement, which for us we just called sensor data. We have our field of light, the value that goes with it, and the time. So that's one thing to note that you might have noticed is that in the previous slide right here is you'll notice there's no time. We're not sending a time, but that's because InfluxDB, if you don't send it a specific time value because you're working with current real-time data, it will just assign a time value based on when the stream reaches the DB. So that's how it works. You could define a time if you wanted, but most people just allow it to go by when it reaches the DB. This is a quick example of how you would downsample. So downsampling is really great in the fact that it allows you to make your data a lot smaller. So this is used a lot in data science and in general people who just don't need to uh, have as much finite data. So when it comes to IoT devices, they are notoriously noisy. They send you lots and lots of data every single nanosecond, millisecond. Just in general, you're going to have a lot of values. They're going to get kind of big and unruly. And depending on the data you're working with, it's not necessary to have it be that finite. You don't need it in, in one second intervals, per se. So instead, what people tend to do is they tend to downsample. And what that basically just means is that they want to do it uh, by like a mean normally. This one's, for example, doing a mean or an average. And they just want to say, for the past 10 minutes, can you please just give me the average amount of light or temperature or humidity? Because I don't need it to be every single second. And then I can go ahead and just, for lack of a better term, delete or drop the data that wasn't a part of my mean. What that would end up looking like is something like this, where now we have our sensor ID, we have a time value, and as you can see, this time value is now jumping for every 10 minutes. And we still have the mean of our humidity and our temperature value. So this is a great way to make your data a lot smaller. And in this project, what we tend to do is we tend to do downsampling before we send the data into the cloud. The idea being pretty straightforward is that in a real life application, this would save a company money, this would save somebody money, in the fact that they would downsample their data before it ever reaches the cloud. Obviously, again, in this small of a project, not so much, but this project is meant to be a bit of a training. It's meant to not only be useful at home, but also just explaining some of the concepts behind it. So edge data replication. So edge data replication is basically making sure that an edge device has on-prem storage that then can be sent up to a cloud when there's connectivity. So normally when we think of an edge device, we tend to think of a solar panel in the middle of a field. It's not connected very often. Maybe it's in a remote region. But an edge device can also be a cell phone turned on during an airplane. It can be a ATM at a bank. Those normally actually have to operate relatively on their own. There's no guarantee that there won't be a power outage that takes out the internet, but the ATM still might need to work. So edge devices can be lots of different types of devices that basically need to be able to run and operate and store their data without always being constantly connected to the cloud. In our application, it's also not uncommon per se that maybe your device would not be always connected to the internet at your home even. Your home could you know, suffer a loss. Or when I take Plant Buddy on the road, when we come to conferences, it's very common that the conference Wi-Fi is very bad not <laughs> uh, and not reliable. And so normally, we do have to back up our data on the Edge device, which is normally my laptop. And then when it reconnects, it sends it up to the cloud. So InfluxDB allows you to do edge data replication. It's a feature that we built out specifically. Uh, now that being said, this is specific to us. It uses the open source. You can actually do edge to cloud between two different open source versions. You don't just have to do open source to the cloud. And from there, it allows you to basically store your data on disk in a disk back queue that then you can go ahead and send up to the cloud when you are connected. Ideally, in an ideal world, you're always connected, but that's not quite how life works. And setting this up is pretty straightforward. This is actually from our GitHub for this project. 
it's basically just in creating a remote connection and then telling it which local bucket and which cloud bucket you would like to have the data stored in. So this is also very easy for us in the fact that we don't have to try to write to client libraries that send data, one to the open source and one to the cloud or anything like that. It just automatically connects them. Data requests and visualizations. So when it comes to querying your data back out, basically what you use is a pretty uh, normal SQL query that basically just says, for this project specifically, it just says, give me all the data points for the past uh, hour, and then I'll go ahead and graph those. But this is also a quick uh, query uh, function, basically, that we're using here, where we say the sensor name. If it's none, then we go ahead and set it to soil moisture. And then we say our bucket, our sensor name, and our device ID that we're expecting. Again, this specific function is written to be reusable. As you can see, bucket, sensor name, and device ID are all variables that are inputted. When I get to the graphing part, it will make a lot more sense, which I think is actually just the next slide. Yeah. So this now makes a little bit more sense as to why we're doing it like this, because as you can see, for each of our graphs, we're sending in that we want the soil temperature, and the device ID is the same for this project, for our example. So we've just got a graph default device ID. Again, it's just a variable being stored above this chunk of code. But what this allows us to do is basically uh, display all of these graphs and just reuse this querying code. So we don't have to rewrite it for every single one. But overall, it's very straightforward. Basically, what you do is you just query the data. OK, that's one thing to note. You do use the query API. And for this, we're querying a data frame back out, because that's what Plotly expects for graphing is a data frame. It's the same thing if you use pandas. They normally expect a data frame as well. And this, I would display this. I, this is kind of tricky to display live, so I've just taken photos of what this looks like. So this is something that we built, and then you can just go ahead. This is the Flask project, basically, once it's like live on a local host. And we have our overall light, which is just this pretty graph. And as you can see, that spike there is actually probably me covering up the light sensor with a hand or something. It's funny in that it's the opposite of what you expect. It goes higher the darker it is, lower the more light it is. Then we have our soil and air temperature, which in this one is pretty stable. That's pretty common, uh, especially when you do things like downsampling over a mean or an average. You tend to end up with very flat lines for these because there's very little change. I'd have to take the plant probably like outside or something to get a little bit more variance. And then you have humidity and soil moisture. And again, soil moisture normally stays pretty consistent. Over the course of days, it you know drops if you don't water your plant. but in just a small snippet, it's pretty much the same. And then humidity tends, tends, to actually, oh, tends to actually go up and down based on if I get really close to the plant and I like breathe near it. <laughs> That's normally what causes it to go up and down like that. And over here on the side, this regenerate grass just basically recalls all of the uh, query function so it can update. So here are those further resources. So this is the GitHub project where you can go ahead and check this out. And again, you'll find uh, pretty much most of the resources I mentioned here. I don't think we actually have the full slide deck on this project, but we do have all those schematics, uh, actually a few other schematics. We have the full instructions on how to get this running locally, how to hook up stuff for your own devices. And just in general, it's a great resource. You're welcome to come join us at our InfluxDB community Slack workspace. Uh, basically, it's a great spot if you have any questions or you want to participate in any kind of conversations. The DevRels, me and my coworkers are there, as well as just in general, our whole community of people who are there to not only get their questions answered, but also help others. You can always try it yourself. So this is a link to our uh, cloud website. And then this is a link to our Influx community, which is where all of our projects live. We have a, you can actually see Plant Buddy right there hanging out in the, in the top because it's a pinned project. But we actually have quite a few projects, uh, things that are more data science related or uh, things that are more IoT device related. We have trainings. And then we also have um, all of our client libraries live here as well. And this is just a great slide of all of the links. So just in case you didn't get photos of them before, this just makes it a little simple. You have your getting started. You have the community forums. 
the Slack that I've already mentioned, our GitHub, which is basically just the Influx community, the same one from the last slide, our docs, our blogs, which are both pretty straightforward. They're just more information. And then our InfluxDB University, which is a completely free, learn at your own pace uh, resource. So you can kind of take classes if you want. And then for people who are using this as a part of their job, it's great because they get little badges on their LinkedIn's. And if anybody has any questions, Hello, Zoe. Yes. My name is Johnny, and thanks for an amazing presentation. And I got a question to ask. Uh, I'm curious about uh, in Plan Body. Do you plan uh, Do you plan to store the data persistently, so you can uh, do some analysis work, like how the plan doing in February, like something like this? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so you can do that for sure. The easiest way is just to set your bucket to not delete the data, so you could just have it. Uh, what other people tend to do um, at a larger scale is what they'll do is they'll downsample their historical data and store it in like a, funny enough, a CSV file or a Parquet file, and then they can run historical aggregations on it, or they'll store it in a bucket if they prefer. But basically what they'll normally do is they'll have two separate data storage, I guess you could call it, their real-time data storage where it's their database and it's running, and that's the one where normally you would delete it maybe after seven days or so, and then their historical data, which is sometimes kept in a separate DB with a longer, what we call retention policy, the amount of time it will stay without being deleted, or in, like I said, a file format. Does that make sense? So where do you do those logic? Uh, in Telegraph or? Uh, so with that, you do it in the UI. So in the UI, the, the, the video where I showed to creating that bucket, that's where you set your retention policy and you could set it to just never and that would be the simplest solution. Then your data would just stay there. If nice. you want to downsample, you'd have to pull it out, downsample it in something like Pandas, and then push it back up. I see. Do, uh, is there any solution that I could maybe use other type of database to store my persistent like um, Postgres, something mm -hmm. like this? You could, yeah. I would also say Postgres wouldn't be bad if you're downsampling it down to averages and means because then your data won't be so large and the SQL DB will probably actually be pretty good for the storage. Uh, you could also use other time series databases if you wanted, though that seems like a little silly to use two separate tools. I think the, the SQL DB, yeah, could actually work pretty well for this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question about um, the uh, the client side ish replication uh, thing you talked about. So, um, suppose you're running your um, client side replication uh, thing on a Raspberry Pi as your first waypoint. So, my question is, um, how uh, how weak of a device um, do you guys recommend for uh, that use case, such that such that you have to run an instance of a uh, influx DB uh, daemon or whatever on um, on the client, and second, um, with respect to a device like Raspberry Pi, where you're using uh, an SD card or um, a solid state storage, um, what uh, do you have anything to say about wear leveling? So I would say one thing we find in our community, especially people come to us with these uh, questions and parameters. We don't have anything officially on our website about this, but most people agree within the community that the Raspberry Pi is probably the smallest device that you could like run an open source influx DB on. We've heard of people running it on smaller devices, but normally the retention policy has to be very small. You're talking you know, less than a day or so, depending on the amount of storage, obviously, that you've put on the device. But yes, we could run on a Raspberry Pi, so you could run the open source InfluxDB on that, and then do the edge to cloud replication from your Pi. Sorry, do you have anything to say about wear leveling when you're using a solid state uh, device for storage? Uh, sorry, could you just repeat the question? So um, take a step back. Uh, so, so if you're writing to like a solid state storage like SD card mm. or SSD, um, I think the understanding is you don't want to write so frequently because you have to write in blocks. And if you write a lot of blocks because you're, you have a lot of IoT devices, then you're going to be overwriting a lot of blocks. And 
Um, in an extreme case, you're going to be overriding a lot of the written blocks, which would uh, reduce the lifespan of the, uh, the storage device. So um, in theory, then, you would like to buffer uh, a, a chunk of data to memory and then write a chunk to the disk when it gets large enough. OK, I think I understand now where I was confused by your question. So the edge data replication, when you're running that, it is already doing the disk back queue. So it does it itself. It stores those chunks appropriately. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure if it actually does it based off the device it's on. I'm not sure it knows, for example, that it's running on like a Raspberry Pi versus something else. But from what I understand, that's already been figured out internally and in that it will know how to store things appropriately in chunks and how to get them back off and how to handle, like you said, the fact that if you send too much data too quickly, it could cause problems. It's meant to handle all of that from what I understand. You might have to check the docs on that one to find out a little bit more. Uh, so I have a quick question. Um, you, so your project actually does some of the down, down sampling? Yes, it okay. does. Okay, are there options, like you said, means-based or average-based? Is that, is that the default, or can you select what type of down sampling you would want to do? Or maybe, like, like let's, let's say you're monitoring at 10 minutes, but you have data from, like, 5 after to 15 after. Could, could it be, like, a, a weighted average? So like the distance squared or something? We're leveraging pandas for this. And so with that in mind, pandas allows you to, yes, customize all of the above. You could, instead of doing the mean, you could do an average function. And from what I understand, yes, they do allow for like a, a look back period, per se. Oh, OK. But do, does your project implement like some, some way the user selects it? Or do, does the, the client code um, write the query in a way that that, that's like for pandas? Does it pass in that? or? So the pandas query is available on the GitHub project, but from there it's customizable, if that makes sense. Like we aren't, yeah. yeah, we don't own pandas, but you can leverage all those tools, and the example is in the project. Okay, thanks. Hey, does anyone have a question? So some, some IoT census data, we, uh, when we don't know how long we will keep the data. So when we create a bucket, can we, can we set up its neighbor delete and then change to the frequently delete regularly? Like yes, that. you can. You can do that. It might take about roughly a day or so for the retention policy to, per se, get going, basically. But after that, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, since the time is still the end, so if you have any further question, we can discuss here after the presentation. Yeah, maybe let's have a pause for the elaboration. Thank you. <laughs>